I'm Brittany Rizzo, and welcome back to My Only Friends. Today, we have an incredibly special episode with Lucy Walsh. She is best known for her work as an actress in film and TV series such as Criminal Minds, No Strings Attached, Mother's Day, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and more. Additionally, Lucy is a producer and singer who has toured internationally with Maroon 5. Now she can add author to the list of her many accomplishments. Lucy's new book, Remember Me as Human, is a tribute to her family and a book of passion and love. It includes her grandparents' World War II love letters, her grandfather's battle with Alzheimer's, and a deeper look into a familial relationship, including excerpts of a life entangled in the Eagles' success, growing up with her father on the road, managing their relationship through his sobriety, and the moment she realized he was famous. This episode reminds me of the Friends episode, the one with the bullies. Phoebe is telling the rest of the friends how she's had and seen so many signs to finally go meet her dad. Although some seem far-fetched in Phoebe's case, Lucy and I talk about the signs we've gotten from the universe from our loved ones. Lucy and I really connected in this interview. The second I said hello to her, it felt as if I had known her for years. After our time together, I felt recharged and full of gratitude. I encourage all of you to get her new book, Remember Me as Human, available for purchase on March 12th. Please enjoy my conversation with the lovely Lucy Walsh. How are you? I'm really good. How are you? I'm so excited to meet you. I don't know why in like just that instant when we said hi, I was like, why do I feel like we already know each other? <laughs> well, I feel like I know you because I've been listening to your podcast episodes for the last couple hours. So that's, that makes that's, me that's so my explanation. <laughs> you know, it's surprising how many people don't listen before they come on. I know. I know. Can you believe it? People just, and that that's part of what I'll be talking about with you today, how people just aren't curious enough. I know. Oh my, oh, I am so curious because let me tell you, I don't even know where to start because I have so many questions <laughs> and I have like, because you have so many, it's like musician, actor, author, classically trained pianist, like all know, these it's a lot. things. And I'm it's like, a lot. and you're a master at all of them and not you know what i mean like well i wouldn't say that but you know <laughs> <laughs> well i i am just like completely i was reading your wikipedia page i'm reading your book and i'm like my brain is just going insane like looking at all these things and like the names and just the like matter of factness of like the people <laughs> in your life and i'm like oh my gosh like especially not being from la right like you think that these people are like so much larger than life. And you're like, yeah, my mom's friend, Kenny Loggins. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Is they're just where normal you, people. Where are you from? They are, I'm from yeah. Las Vegas. Oh, so you are a wow. tiny bit of, of yeah. You got a little life. showbiz. Yeah. Yeah. Were you allowed to go to the strip when you were young? Well, I still did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's funny because growing up in Vegas, like, if you wanted to, like now it's different, but if you wanted to go bowling when you were right. 13 years old, you had to bring a parent because it was attached to a casino. So it was like, oh yeah, after, you know, eight or 9 PM and who wants to be with their parents when you're 13, 14 oh my years God, old? No, embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you, I mean, <laughs> maybe your parents. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, my dad's pretty crazy. Um, wow. Well, that's fascinating. You're from Vegas. So it was a hop, skip and a jump over to LA for you. It was, but I, I moved here and back like three times before it stuck and before it like worked out for me. Yeah. And I still feel like, well, is it sticking? I don't know. 12 years later. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So first of all, let's talk about this book. Like I want to get into this book, but I wanted to know so the title is Remember Me as Human. And how did you come up with that title? Why did that stick out to you out of all of this? Well, that's a question that I was advised not to tell the truth about, but I'm mm. going to tell you. Mm. <laughs> so Remember Me as Human is the title of the book. And after my grandmother died which was only four months after I interviewed her, which is mm -hmm. what the book is about, the three days that I spent with her in her nursing home interviewing her. She died four months later. She was 97. And 
it took me 14 years to finish this book. So it was a long time later that I was coming to the end of writing and I still didn't have a title. And there were some things in that interview in my family, as in all our families that are hard to cope with there, you know, there's alcoholism, there's mental illness, there's some molestation that's gone on. And I'm talking over the last hundred years, Mm -hmm. because this is a family memoir that spans a lot of time here. Um, I keep opening the door here because I'm letting the cats in and out. No, you're fine. (laughs) They can never make up their mind. Come in, Jessica Daisy Bing Bings. I love that name. That's a great name. You got to name them ridiculous names. Absolutely. Otherwise, what's the point? (laughs) So anyway, during the time I was writing, getting close to the end, I was very, very stuck. Mm. I had a bit of writer's block because I wasn't sure how much of the truth to tell about those hard things that exist in my family history. I didn't know if I should fabricate it a little bit. You know, we try to protect our family members kind of thing, even if they're dead. And, um, and my grandmother had already died and I went to a medium. Mm -hmm. I went to a a spiritual medium and uh, this man did not know I was writing a book and he pulled me up into a circle of about 30 strangers And he said, your grandmother's here and she wants to tell you how to finish your book. And I said, oh, thank God, because I have no idea. And I feel like I can't do it. I feel like I'm going to give up. Yeah. And she said, you must tell the truth. She said, I know you've been struggling with how to do this and you've got to tell the truth. And I said, "Uh, even about the one thing, because there's one thing in the book in particular that's pretty harrowing. And uh, she said, even the one thing, especially the one thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, but it makes you look bad. And she said, no, it makes me look human. And Mm -hmm. I want to be remembered as human. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got the title from my grandmother on the other side after she died. (laughs) That gave me goosebumps. Yeah. In the book, I write about it being a dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Just so, you know, readers that don't believe in that stuff don't get you know, tripped up, but, um, that's actually what happened. Right. And I know you don't like scary things. I don't know if you like, do you consider paranormal scary or it it depends? just not like the horror. It depends. Like, I mean, (laughs) the other day my Alexa went off and she just started like out of nowhere, just started playing Taylor Swift. And I was like, okay, well this ghost can stay like, (laughs) yeah, you're like, I like this spirit is cool. (laughs) She just says, you know, experiencing the eras. It's okay. She could stay. But when the lights start flickering and stuff, I'm like, oh no, you gotta go. You gotta go. (laughs) Gotta move on. Yeah. So that stuff is like, I definitely, there are times where I'm like, like I've woken up before I felt like a cold chill go right past my bed. Like I felt somebody walk past me and it was woken me up. That stuff. I'm like, "Uh I don't know how I feel about that. Like living alone, you're kind of like, Oh, I don't like this. It's true. We're very sensitive. mm -hmm. But I definitely, you know, I believe in, I think that our loved ones are still very much connected to us. I definitely believe in that. And this book is so special because our relationships with our grandmas are so special. Oh, I know. Like I'm so close with my grandma and I always say she's the reason I know I'm not adopted because (laughs) (laughs) like we are so similar in a lot of things. And when I was reading this book, like I, I went home to Las Vegas over the weekend for a family matter. And after like reading chunks of this book, I was sitting with her in a different way. I was, I put my phone away and I'm trying to remember every single thing that she's saying to me. And I always love asking her these stories about her childhood or growing up and hearing the beginning of her and my pop pops relationship. And it's, it's just so special. And they're so deeply, their stories are so deeply rooted in us. They are. And so I want you to talk about what inspired you like to start writing this book because you found the letters from yes. your grandfather to your grandma. Yes. And was it in that moment that you were like, I want to write a whole book about this? Or did the book become something completely different than you, what you thought it was going to be? Yeah, I've heard you talk about your grandmother. And mm. I know you're really close. And I'm so 
happy that you have that time with her because so many people have lost their grandparents and their parents. And it's extraordinary. The response I've gotten from this book and it hasn't even come out yet. Um, and I can tell what a massive impact it could potentially have because it's a universal response that I get, which is people very emotional saying to me, God, I wish I had asked my father about this, or I wish I had been more curious about my grandma while I had the chance. And I say about this book, it will inspire you to ask more questions of your loved ones while you still have them here. Mm -hmm. Because when we die, all our memories and all our stories go with us yeah. and there's no getting that back. And if we, we take each other for granted, we're going to regret it. So what you just said is the highest compliment mm -hmm. I could get as, as the author of this. And it just means the world to me to hear you say that. I, I wish that for everyone. And that's my that's my my goal. My my purpose is to inspire others to be more curious about each other. So to answer your question, why I wrote this book and how it came to be uh, was something that started when I was 17. My grandmother, Wanda, gave me 63 of the remaining love letters that my grandfather, Dale, had written to her during World War II. They didn't see each other for three years while he was fighting from 1943 to 1945. There was no Zoom. There was no FaceTime. They did not hear each other's voices for three years. All they had were these letters. And they wrote hundreds back and forth, but they were all lost except for these 63 that he wrote. I don't have a single one of hers. He had to burn them all because he was right behind the front lines. And he writes about it in a letter that he's devastated that he had to burn all of her letters. Mm -hmm. So when I was 17 and I got these letters, I knew immediately that one day I would I wanted to uh, make them into a film. I had no idea I would ever write a book. That was not on my mind. But I knew that the letters were very important and that I had to make them into a film. I didn't know how to do that, but I knew that I wanted to aim for Ron Howard. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had seen just these epic war war stories that Ron Howard and Tom Hanks had done. And, and I knew that those were my guys. And so I, I spent <laughs> years carrying the letters in my purse in case I ran into Ron Howard, like at the grocery store. You know what? And I love that so much. I honestly did. I did. I took them everywhere with me. And <laughs> I love that so much because my parents are the type of people who believe in that. They're like, I'll, I'll be like, oh, I saw Wanda Sykes at the grocery store. And they're like, well, did yeah. you ask her for a job? Yeah. <laughs> That's not how it works. So it's like... <laughs> But hey, you you were like, no, that's how it's gonna work. And I that's know how it. it's gonna work. Yeah. And <laughs> and honestly, yeah, I mean, you don't want to freak people out, but um Gary Marshall, the prolific director who who was a dear mentor of mine before he died and cast me in his final film, Mother's Day, and all kinds of great stuff he he championed for me. He told me, he described that to me as bump-ins. And he told me that some of his biggest projects had begun that way. Mm -hmm. um, he was no fool. He hosted a basketball game at his house every weekend for years. And the point of that basketball game was for people to come and bump in and and discuss their their lives and their projects so so there's a lot of power to it but yeah it's a fine line isn't it between <laughs> it's just yeah i love that though that's really down. like that's really amazing and generous of him to do like to just like it really yeah but i feel like that's how you know this town works it's like you just surround yourself with really amazing people and then you get yeah. new opportunities and you do you do because yeah. it's just connecting with people that you like mm -hmm. and passing throwing the ball back and forth you right. know right um so anyway so you know all all i knew to do when i was 17 and into my early 20s when i was carrying these letters around i just thought okay well oh, I don't know how to do this, but I just need to start asking questions. And I felt like a squirrel collecting nuts for winter or something. I was just like, I'll collect all the information for later until I figure it out. So I started asking questions about the letters, about my grandparents' lives. But then 
my grandfather died with Alzheimer's before I actually, before I got a chance to ask him much of anything at all. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, very shocking for me to witness him die that way. And it really scared me because a, because of everything that was lost that could have been mm -hmm. learned from him, but also because I didn't know where Alzheimer's was going to strike next because mm -hmm. I watched this person be stolen from me long before they died. And I was terrified of that happening to someone else. And so my mind like decided that the way I was going to beat Alzheimer's and never let it win was to like collect everybody's memories. Mm -hmm. And so I just like became like a freak about like interviewing people. I'll interview anyone. Like I'm just obsessed with like, like hearing people's stories because everybody has an incredible story inside of them. Everybody. That's like the and most like, like productive trauma response ever. It is a trauma response. I'm glad you said that because but it it's definitely like, it's was. a good one. It's like not not a good one, but it's like, well, you're getting something, you're turning it into something positive. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, that ultimately led me to interviewing my grandmother, Wanda, for three days in her nursing home when she was 97. And I filmed it uh, and I plan to turn that into a documentary here soon but the book is about those three days that I spent with her in her nursing home mm -hmm. shortly before she died and uh the film is I've written the film as well it's different from the book there's no granddaughter in the nursing home it takes place back in during World War II and it's a bit more fictionalized but still based on the same events and characters mm-hmm Mm -hmm. So that's it. 14 years later, the book is publishing 14 years after I had the conversation with Wanda in her nursing home. Uh, I have achieved this, which has been an impossible feat in my life. It's very surreal that I finally got it over the finish line. I well, can't believe it. Congratulations. And like Thank I said, I think, it's, I think it's so beautiful. And having those moments with her and those memories with her and just learning her history and your own yeah. history what would you say was the letter because you have the letters in your book some of them yeah i have some excerpts i have about 40 excerpts of the letters what would you say what which letter really affected you well, there was one letter in particular. Again, this is a paranormal story. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. When, when my grandfather died, I was in my early 20s, and my mom asked me to speak at his funeral. And I knew that I wanted to read one of the letters, but I didn't know which one to read. And I was a working actor and musician by then in Hollywood, and I flew to Illinois, like the morning of the funeral, mm -hmm. you know, um, you were talking with another, a friend of mine, actually, Cameron Copperthwaite on, on oh, your Cam. podcast. Yeah. Cam and I just did a movie together. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Cam is the best. I know, but you guys were discussing how, like, you really give up a lot to do what we do. And I know you're an accomplished actress as well. Like you have to miss some important things sometimes, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm grateful that I made it to the funeral, but God, it was a tight squeeze. So anyway, I took the letters on the plane and I said, okay, grandpa, I don't know which one you want me to read, but you got to give me a sign. And I'm reading through these letters and I came across one that just really hit me in a different way than the others. It was really sweet. It was very passionate. It was very poetic. It was a little sexy. It's really funny to like read him being sexy back in the forties, like when it was being army examined and they couldn't really like yeah. say as much as they wanted, but it was just a really uh, like unique letter. And I decided that that was, that was the one. And so I was reading it to my mom in the car on the way to the funeral and my grandfather mentioned some dates in the funeral, in, in the letter. And, and she, he said, you know, sweetie, uh, you told me you wrote me on, on January 9th, but you must have been mistaken because today's January 9th and blah, blah, blah. And my mom gasped and she said, Lucy, today is January 9th. The day of the funeral was the date that he had mentioned in the letter. And I hadn't even realized that when I got the feeling that this was the right one. But mm -hmm. it was just a beautiful 
confirmation message from him after his passing that that that's the one he wanted me to read. And I actually include that in the book in its entirety because mm -hmm. it's a, a special one to me. Yeah, the synchronicities are always signs to me, always. Oh, yeah. Nothing's by accident ever. Nothing. Nothing. I had I had um, something kind of paranormal happen, I guess you would say. Well, <gasps> Do tell. So, and this will sound crazy to, again, to people who don't believe in this stuff. Yeah, whatever. But Go get a cup I, of coffee while we're talking about right? it. Right? <laughs> But so I was, there was one night I was reading to my nephew. He has a friend's book, um, like a children's book about like feelings are better with friends. And it's like the friends cast. And oh, right. he had learned the theme song for the first time. And so out of nowhere, I'm reading to him and he just starts singing, I'll be there for you. And I was like, oh my gosh, like crying because then I, because <laughs> I'm so proud. But then yeah. it was like shortly after Matthew Perry had passed away. Right. And then I had a friend pass away like a month prior to that. And so it, it just like, thank you. But it's just, I, I was like overwhelmed with this like grief and also like, like, wow, like how beautiful is it that this little three-year-old is like just learning who Matthew Perry is for the first time, but also how sad is it that he'll never know like the world with him in it really. Yeah. And I just wanted a sign that people were okay. Like, just let me know. Like, I hope that nobody's suffering and like, I literally just wanted, I was like, just please give me a sign that you're okay. The next morning, I swear, I get this email and it says subject. And I've never gotten a spam email like this in my entire life, like hand to God. The subject, it says from Matthew Perry, the subject line says, sometimes things don't work out the way we want. Oh my God. I, it was, I was like, what, what, what is this? Like literally the morning after. I had, it was so, I have a screenshot of it. Cause I was like, am I losing my mind? Like this can't, I like, I had just woken up and saw it and I was like, this can't be real. Like, is somebody messing with me right now? It was, it was terrible. I was like, this is amazing, but also like, what is happening right now? Ask and you <laughs> shall receive. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. We're very powerful. We are very, very powerful. We are. And it's funny because like going back to the letters, I kept thinking about, well, one, I, I have not been able, every time I read your book and re like read your story, I keep thinking of the word timeless. Mm -hmm. And you chose Dick Van Dyke as one of your shows that you watch I all the did. time, which is another timeless, like your whole theme and like your Wikipedia page, all timeless. Like there's so many things that you've been a part of that are timeless. Yeah. And Taylor Swift has a song called Timeless. Of oh, course. okay. I haven't heard it. But it's about writing love letters. Oh, wow. And it's like, even if we met um, in 1944 and you were headed off to go fight in the war. Yeah. You still would have been mine. You still would have been timeless. And like, that's all I kept thinking about when I'm reading this book. Like, I envision it so much. And it's just so whimsical and romantic, but also heartbreaking. Yeah. But there's something so beautiful about the fact that they loved each other that much to write each other all the time without Zoom and texting and calling and this and that. Like, it just spoke volumes of like the love that they had for one another, which I just thought was so beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. It really took a lot of work mm -hmm. to nurture a relationship back then that we're not used to today. It's so easy for us to pick up a phone or text somebody and we really we really take that connection for granted we can see our loved ones across the country on on a screen we can be to each other across the world in in a day and that just didn't exist back then you really had to appreciate your relationships in a much different way i think mm -hmm. and we're losing that we're losing that because of technology and ai and um we need, I stand for preserving our humanity and mm -hmm. our human connection because man, it's a scary world if we lose that. And I like what you're saying about the timeless. I, I always am interested in being involved in projects that are timeless. I'm, I really get turned off by topical things. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we live in an age where it's all about being topical. And to me, that's just 
dead, dead energy Mm -hmm. because next week it'll be something else. Right. And nobody cares, you know, they, 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 they think they, they, they're lying to themselves. Like, you know, I have to post about the world's happenings this week with the hashtag. So everybody sees that I posted with the hashtag, but then nobody's talking about it in two weeks because they're onto something else. And, and I really shy away from that kind of thing. I, I care more about digging in and making an actual difference that will last forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whether it's, you know, volunteer work or actually like getting out there and talking to people or talking about issues that are, that are not easy, you know, mental health. I know you talk a lot about all that kind of stuff and that's what, that's timeless because that anything that makes us human is timeless. (laughs) Right. Right. I, so on the heels of, I'm jumping around my questions. I'm, that's why I'm looking down. I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> no, please. Um, but I'm jumping around my questions because the things you say, like they spark it for me. And one of my questions was going off of mental health about yeah. how you heal your inner child, because you write in the book, how guarded you became with your dad always yeah. leaving. And you said why should i love him at all if he's going to leave and i then you talk about how you thought it was your fault when he left and did you realize that as you got older like where was it was that kind of behavior seeping into other relationships for you to go oh this is stemmed from my relationship with my father or did you kind of always know were you did were you very young when you became aware of those feelings that's a great question it's been in my book i thank my dad in the acknowledgments as my greatest teacher in this life Mm. he can take that to mean whatever he wants it to mean (laughs) because it has not been an easy road But I really mean it because I was born into a situation with having an incredibly famous family, not only my father being in the Eagles, but my uncle being in the Beatles, where I got to, uh, it's crazy, it's crazy, it's crazy. I've gotten to see the inside of fame Mm. and it's all smoke and mirrors. It has really been the perfect learning ground for me to overcome all the issues that came with it, which like you mentioned, are that enough, I must not be lovable to think that somebody who's famous is better than anyone else or different or not human. It's a lie. It's misinformation that I really hope to debunk with the, with the topic of my book, remember me as human. Mm -hmm. And I was born into this perfect learning ground for overcoming the challenges that came with having fame in the family. Mm -hmm. I did internalize it when I was young and I saw my dad leaving all the time. I took it to mean because children are so literal. I took it to mean that I wasn't good enough. It must be my fault. If I could only figure out how to be lovable enough, then he would stay. Mm. Uh, And that is not something I was aware of as I grew older to answer your question, no. But it did wreak havoc on my life. Mm -hmm. And and I am just now entering my 40s, really uh, healing all of that and and becoming as self-aware as I I have the potential to be about it. Uh, It led me on some interesting paths One was that I decided in my child's brain that was fighting for survival and love that the way to get dad's love and attention, if he was in that world of fame, I needed to be in that world too. Mm. And so it put me on this path of chasing fame for a really long time. I didn't know that's why I was chasing fame Mm -hmm. on like a conscious daily level, but, um, now I can see that that's what was really pushing me into this grind. I mean, I became so obsessed with becoming famous, Brittany, like it was, 
I was very, very physically and mentally like weakened and unwell. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I didn't, I I just, I didn't care about anything in life until I could achieve that. And I would die to have it. Like I would have done, if you spoke to me 10, 20, you know, 20, 15 years ago, I would have died to book an acting job. (laughs) I would have given anything. And again, to mention Gary Marshall, who was such a big part of my life, he has a little bench at the Little Brown Church on Coldwater Canyon. And on that bench is a plaque and it says, life is more important than show business. Hmm. And I would sit there with him sometimes and, and I would say to him, I don't agree with you, Gary. <laughs> And he'd say, you will someday, you know, and, yeah. and he's gone now. And the night he died, I went and I sat on that bench and and since then i've gone to sit many times and i and i and i now agree with him because i don't chase fame anymore to gain anybody's affection mm-hmm. or anybody's love i don't chase anything outside of myself to know that i'm worthy that i'm good enough that i am great and lovable just as i am in this very moment beautifully flawed and that comes back to the book which is celebrating our humanity. That's what we all have in common. Famous people too. And isolating famous people by thinking that they're any different from you is very depressing from the outside and very depressing on the inside. Whew, I'm making me cry. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like it's, it's like, yes, yes, all of that, yes. Yeah. Like, and I'm so happy that you got to that point of realization because I mean, people will waste their whole lives trying to fill this void inside of them that and reaching on the outside. And exactly. It's not just with fame. Like that Mm -hmm. was where, what I was born into that circumstance, but we do it in countless ways. We do it in the most, in the simplest ways uh, constantly. I mean, look at social media. We're all about covering our true humanity with a filter and with Mm -hmm. smiles and, and, and it's, it's, it's very dangerous for ourselves and for the collective human race, Mm -hmm. because we are, um, we are, you know, just isolating ourselves from each other. And that connection is going away because we're looking at everyone else. You know, Mm -hmm. I caught myself comparing my body to a girl on Instagram, as you do. Yeah. And then I realized that it was an AI. Jesus Christ. And I was, (laughs) I was, I was terrified of where we're headed because I thought, wow, I am sitting here tort, like punishing myself. uh, And it's the image isn't even real. Mm -hmm. And the scary part is we can't tell the difference anymore. Mm -hmm. and that's why depression is at an all-time high that's why suicide is at an all-time high and 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 we got to be careful i hope that everyone listening will join me in this quest to to nurture our humanity and stay connected to each other Mm -hmm. i can't tell you how many conversations and i know you'll agree with me that i've been in where the other person doesn't ask me a single question about myself Mm mm-hmm and I'm standing there going, uh, what's wrong? What, what, what's going on here? Yeah. Like what's going on? We yeah. talk at each other about ourselves and we think that that's intimacy. And then we wonder why we feel so devastatingly lonely. Yeah. It's yeah. not okay. Get curious. I don't give a fuck what you have to do to get curious about other people, but fucking handle it. Yeah. Because it's not okay. And don't you dare come up to me and try to engage if it's not going to be a two-way connection. Mm-hmm. I won't have it in my life anymore. I won't be around it. I won't have it near me. And I really, really get so just up in arms thinking about where we're headed if we don't if we don't get more curious. Yeah, they're just removing all the bullshit and having human connection. And I'm sure you've heard me say it on this podcast. Like, that's why I love doing it because- nobody's looking at their phone for an hour and a half and nobody like nothing else matters but like us two people talking and we're not yeah i mean i always do these episodes as if no one's gonna listen to them because (laughs) if i think somebody's listening then i'm gonna filter myself and like your grandma says like you have to tell the full truth and like you do people don't want to hear the half-ass they want people as much as 
it's all smoke and mirrors outside. We all want something real and a human connection. Yeah, we really do. That's what we're all craving. And like you said about f- knowing that you're not adopted because of how similar you are to your grandmother, we are all aching to understand ourselves. Mm-hmm. And the only way we're going to do that is through looking at where and who we've come from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the only way to solve the puzzle. And then you and then you get to the end of your life and, and you you realize, wow, that it's not a puzzle that you can solve. But <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I'm in therapy right now and she'll be like, and where did you learn that from? And I'm like, oh, like somebody in my family. I'm like, mm, yeah. that's where I got that thought. That's where I got that the learned behavior. That's where I picked up that habit. Yeah. Like, and you, yeah, you exactly. understand yourself more when you know you know, and you get curious. Yeah. And the book is really about and touches on this a lot about breaking these family cycles that have been Mm -hmm. passed down through generations. It's not just genes that we pass down. It's the emotional stuff that we pass down. And when, who is going to take a stand and and put an end to it and say, this Mm -hmm. is going to end right now with me. We're going to talk about this. Right. right. When's it going to end? And so I've, I've tried to do that with this book. Well, I didn't try. It just happened naturally in the writing process, but uh, you know, I've ruffled some feathers with some family members. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There, There are big fat family secrets that, that nobody wants to talk about. And, 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 Sometimes they're protecting people that have been dead a hundred years. Right. It's just insane. (laughs) Right. Now, going back to, you know, you said you did it in the beginning for the fame. I had that question of like, you know, did you get into the industry because your dad was like, did you think like, this is exactly what I have to do? So you kind of answered that. But would you say like acting was your passion or singing is your passion or like, when was the moment you realized you were doing it for you and that you really felt ignited by doing this other than I just want to be famous? Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, as I mentioned that, that abandonment issue attached to fame kind of subconsciously pushed me towards that. That's, you know, not the full picture because I've Mm -hmm. been, I've been a, an artist and a, performer since I was born. So I Mm -hmm. have always known exactly what my soul's purpose was, never questioned it, uh, never done any, anything else to speak of. (laughs) Uh, I have a very full life. Like I coach, I have my own, uh, performing arts studio and, and there's many things in life that I'm curious about, but it was never a question to me of what my, my career path would be. So I remember my earliest, epiphany that I was an actor or was uh, around five years old and I would watch Gone with the Wind over and over and over mm. and Vivian Lee on that screen I I had I just like pointed and just recognized that that was what I was and that that's what I would devote my life to mm-hmm. and uh, I asked my mom to get me in an acting class and she said no she wouldn't let me She really kept me very far away from the world of show business. Uh, She said, you're going to have a normal childhood, but when you turn 16, if you still want to get in an acting class, then I will fully support it. And on my 16th birthday, I handed her the phone and said, get me in an acting class, which (laughs) which she did. Um, But since I, I wasn't allowed to pursue an acting career yet, I... I was always pointing at things and saying I wanted them when I was little and then going out and figuring out how to do it. Mm. (laughs) But when I was 10, she took me to see the Nutcracker Ballet and I saw Clara, the lead role in the Nutcracker. And I pointed and said that I'm going to dance. I'm going to be her. Mm. Get me, get me in ballet class. And my mom did. And so I danced pre-professionally from 10 years old. And when I was 17, I got that role and I danced that part. And I had really terrible knee injuries that caused Mm -hmm. me to stop dancing. But that was my way of pursuing an acting career on the stage in the meantime, while I wasn't allowed to in Mm -hmm. Hollywood. (laughs) Yeah. Because I performed in all the ballets and got to act, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, that was my earliest, my earliest 
kind of acting inspiration was Vivian Lee. Unfortunately, you know, the character of Scarlett O'Hara is one that I wish I didn't ad admire so much, but you know, she, <laughs> yeah. Was there um, like a show growing up where you were like, you felt like you really were reflected in that? Like you were like, oh, they're going through what I'm going through. Like, I don't feel so alone. Yes. The character that I really saw myself in when I was young and really like glommed onto. I mean, if I liked something, maybe you were the same. Like I would watch it on daily, like Girl. every, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's a, it's like a problem. I literally I know between I know. friends and Gilmore girls and oh my God. Titanic. My mom won't even watch these shows with me. Cause she's like, you need to stop. Cause I'll be mouthing the words. Yeah. But it's like, it's the only thing I that I, I'm obsessed that when I, I like know. something, I become obsessed. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me too. Yeah. So for me, that was Anne of Green Gables. Mm. Um, the, it was like a television mini series played mm -hmm. by me Megan Fellows. Yeah. Anne of Green Gables. Do you know about this? I don't. Oh, so it's a, it's a book series written in the 1800s by Lucy Maud Montgomery about a little redheaded outcast orphan girl mm -hmm. who just has these hilarious mishaps everywhere she goes and she's just the kindest little funniest little most vulnerable little open-hearted soul and i always really uh felt so comforted by her because we all have that that aspect of us mm -hmm. that's that little goofy little buck tooth vulnerable soul <laughs> you know yep. even if we walk around looking like a yep. model <laughs> we've all got this little soft underbelly yeah and um that really impacted me and and helped me through my childhood was that character of Anne of Green Gables but you know like you mentioned Dick Van Dyke man and I saw you were watching the show, which is so yeah. sweet. That made yeah. me so happy. Um, Dick Van Dyke, anyone who knows me well can tell you that I have this obscene, insane obsession with Dick Van Dyke. I always have from my childhood. My sister is the same way. She's like, Mary Poppins is like everything to her. I know. Yeah. yeah. So his show was like a big one for me and all his movies like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then it's this infectious joy that he expresses and, and and it just pours out of his heart. It just, oh God, he to me is just like the sun. I just, I want to be yeah. close to him. And then when I got a little older and I started to learn more about his life and I would read his biographies and everything, he has had such a dark journey through alcoholism and oh. mental health that it is shocking that that man was able to smile at all. And he's a fascinating guy. And I got to meet him a few years ago. I was just going to ask if you met him. Like, how did that go? Did you like, were you out of body? Were you like, oh my God, he's I was, me. yes. I mean, he was like surrounded by people because he's elderly now, mm -hmm. you know, he's like a hundred years old. Insane. Um, But but yeah, I did like, I mean, even, you know, it's like at a party situation and like, even if you are next to them in the party, like they're not going to get it. You're not going to like <laughs> be able to like take your heart out of your chest and truly show them what they mean to you. So sometimes in those situations, I feel like, oh, what's the point? Like, you know, just, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. See, it's hard because for me, I'm like. I will always, I don't have a problem going up to people if I really Oh, I don't them. either. Like when I met Bette Midler, I got down on my knees and kissed her hand, like in a room <laughs> full of people. Like, I don't care. Yeah. But for some reason with him, like he couldn't hear very well. And like, yeah. I knew it would be a struggle. And it was just yeah. like, eh, you know what? Yeah. I'll just yeah. Blow, him I mean, a blow him a kiss from across yeah. the room. <laughs> I mean, that's how Jennifer Aniston is my Dick Van Dyke. So it's really, like, and of course you were in my Have you met her thing. yet? Well, I met her and I completely like blacked out and it was like in happenstance, like she walked in the same bathroom I was in and I was wearing a central perk mask and I was like, oh my God. You we... were? Oh yeah. And what she was like- What do you mean like, a mask? Like a it was full like, face mask? Like during, or like after COVID, we were at the oh. dentist. We were at the dentist. <laughs> oh my God. Like, and, and I was like- uh, I thought I was you like, like a ski mask. Like you had- Oh like my God. A... Yeah. In her bushes. <laughs> Oh my god! But it was like one You're of like, those. I met her at the court date when she had yeah, to exactly. come to this, this stalking case. 
oh my god I uh, no let's not manifest that <laughs> no. No. oh my gosh <laughs> but yeah she she was so sweet but it was a very jolted me like she was running late I was waiting for the elevator and it was like ah, uh, uh, yeah. and I didn't get to tell her everything and like you said you're like you want to you just want to take your heart out and be like look your face is on it look I know <laughs> look it's you it's you look it's you <laughs> Oh my, god. oh my god that is you'll so get funny a, you'll get around to don't worry um oh my the, gosh. the only person i ever blacked out when i have i we could talk for days about my stories of meeting crazy people but uh the only person i ever almost passed out with and actually blacked out was barack obama at the white oh, house yeah, i got to, understandably <laughs> i got to meet the president and michelle when my dad got the kennedy center award and uh, I, I had to hang on to a chair. That was a tough one. Well, because you're like, how am I here? Like, how? I was just like, hello, I voted for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. That is so funny. I could imagine, like, oh. like, there's also probably people that you've met where you're like, oh, I didn't even realize they were a big deal. They Do you want to like hear this? You want to hear the craziest yes. one? Because yes. this is another, like, Dick Van Dyke moment for me because of the shining which i'm sure you can't even be in the same room with no saw like 20 seconds of it and i was like this is the worst 20 seconds yeah. of my life <laughs> so when i when i was like 10 for some reason that was like one of my favorite movies and i'd watch it every day but i don't know why i don't know who let me do that at 10 years old but um i blame my dad he was away on tour a lot so mm -hmm. it's his fault but i was obviously like you know just obsessed with Jack Nicholson. And my dad took me as his date to Don Henley's wedding because he wanted me to see what, like, he wanted me to experience like a proper event, you know? Yeah. And um, we went in a limo. It was like a daddy daughter date. It was really sweet. And we're sitting at a table at the reception. And this guy, I'm sitting next to my dad, and this guy's like leaned over me, talking to me, and he has sunglasses on. And he's just like really curious about me, like really charming, not in a weird way because I was 12, but he's he's um, just talking to me and talking to everybody and for like a long time. And finally he turns away and I'm like, dad, who the hell is this like guy, man? And he's like, that's Jack. That's Jack. Oh, my God. And I was like, what? And the only thing I'd ever seen him in was The Shining. The Shining. And so I like turned back around and he had his like arm around the back of my chair. So I couldn't go anywhere. And then he's like, would you like to dance? And he was my first dance. Jack Nicholson was. I love that. That's amazing. But I didn't know who he was at first because like, you don't put two and two together sometimes. Right. Especially when you're young, you're like, no, you're not, you're, you're in the TV. You're, like, you're how not are you in here? real life. Like, yeah, exactly. You're on the TV. <laughs> like, how are you also here? <laughs> There's no way that that's how it works. I mean, that's apparently what, that's when I moved to LA. It was like, wait, how are you? You're real? Like these yeah. are real people? I mean, I was also like when I was young, I thought people on the radio, like the radio, I thought people literally went into the radio In station there. and sang every time the song came on. Like I didn't know that's it was hilarious. like a recording. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. That's so funny. <laughs> apparently when I was like five and I'd see my dad on TV, I would just go like, how did he get so small? That's so <laughs> like, funny. How is he in there? <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah, that is, that's gotta be wild. I mean, with television, Dick Van Dyke and the other influences that you've had, but with music, you've also toured a lot. So yeah. I would say like, I mean, was your dad a big musical influence or were you like, no, that's my dad. My dad's not cool. Like when you were younger, you know what I mean? <laughs> like who was really cool to you in the music world that inspired you to go like, I want to, I want to be like her. Yeah. I always, I just grew up in the music aside from my dad and my uncle, like my grandparents were musicians. My grandmothers were both musicians and so on Wanda's side my mom's mom I grew up with like the gospel harmonies mm. and her playing the organ in her living room and playing by ear like soulfully and then on my dad's side his mom was a sight trained like insanely trained sight reading musician and she was a pian pianist for the New York City Ballets and um, so I was getting like all these different aspects of being a musician, 
And it was just always a given. Like I was just always musical. I was always mm-hmm. going to be a singer. Like most kids are pushed to be like a lawyer or something. I was just, music was like the most important thing in our family. And it was great that I had, that I was like born with that skill. And also that I had an example of a parent of like success in music already because I think a lot of us have to struggle when we tell our parents that we want to be an actor or a musician they get afraid because they don't think there's any money in it Mm -hmm. and so they try to like talk you out of it and they're like well you know you should have a backup plan so you're not a starving artist Mm -hmm. that word did not exist in my family because my dad's one of the most successful musicians of all time and so I never had any of that like negativity on pursuing life as a, as an Mm. artist. Mm -hmm. And another great thing about growing up around that was that I got to see the work ethic that went into that level of success. Like I never had any confusion about the hundreds of hours it takes to get out on that stage and make it look effortless. My dad always said like, you need to be able to deliver live. You must if you mm-hmm. can't deliver live, like you're, you're a joke. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and he also said, if you want to do this, I am not going to pick up the phone for you. I'm not going to get you a record deal. You're going to go do this on your own. And I did. And, and, and did I, you and feel I, any like resentment towards that or were you like, fine, I'll prove you wrong. Yeah. It was like, great. Like I've got everything I need. I've got my skill. I've got the love of it. Like I, Mm -hmm. I've always had a compulsion to do what we do. I, I have to be acting and singing and writing and creating. I have to like, Mm -hmm. it's my lifeblood. It's the reason I I've gotten up every single day of my entire life. And it's the only thing that helps me like outrun my fear of mortality. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know if I don't I don't even I can't even say what life would be like if I if I didn't have my art anyway um so I did and I went out there and when I uh, again my mom wouldn't let me pursue anything professionally but when I graduated high school I said okay I know that I want to be in this world how do I do this and my only idea was to move to Hollywood and start, I would go to shows. I would go to clubs. I would go to concerts and I'd stand by the stage door afterwards. And I would introduce myself to the musicians. And through doing that, I became friends with people who eventually asked me to join their bands and go on tour with them. And my career began. They were bumpins. uh, Those bumpins. Those bumpins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like we're saying, like you put yourself to achieve anything, you you immerse yourself in that world and then you start connecting mm-hmm. with people around you. Mm-hmm. I swear to God, there is nothing you can't achieve if you use this work ethic and show up co- consistently, you know, for what you want. It will happen. Yeah. And um, and from there, I, I, I toured with, you know, various bands and then I got my own record deal. I was signed by jay-z to island def jam Mm -hmm. and um i just i've always had this like little thought in my brain like if i get scared to do something or i like i feel like it's too hard i just kind of like take that little critical brain and i like remove it from my head and i go okay you're gonna you're gonna sit over here while i go do this because I don't need to listen to you right now. I have to go do this. And then I, I hear what you're saying. I hear that you're afraid. I hear that it sounds impossible, but 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 you're going to sit in the corner while I go achieve it anyway. Yes. And, and that's what I did when I got my record deal. Like I had like nine meetings lined up in three days in New York. And I took a guitarist with me and we walked into Island Def Jam and LA Reid and Jay-Z and these people are in there. And, um, And my guitarist was like fucking up the song because he was so nervous. And I thought, oh, my God, oh, my God, he's like going to ruin this for me. So I reached over and I put my hand on his guitar and I stopped him. And I didn't say a word. I took each of the men because it was all men in the room. I was the only woman. Uh, I took each of the men by the shoulders and I pulled up chairs around the piano and I sat them in the chairs And I sat down and I played a song that I had written on the piano and they signed me right then and there. 
Um, what an and- incredible <laughs> example of trusting yourself though. Yeah. I mean, it was Amazing. either that or go down with the Titanic and I wasn't going to do that. So, <laughs> you know, the people in the Titanic that just lay down and let the water run over them. That would be yeah, me. Honestly, that's what we're not going to do. <laughs> Jack fought really hard and Zin didn't get it. So I don't know. I think I, I would just be laying there. <laughs> Anyone was going to get it. It would have been him. But... I know. But no, that's an incredible Look, it's hard. Like nerves and fear. I mean, fear can really debilitate you and stop really you does. from doing so much. And learning to turn that fear into some sort of motivation yeah. in that f- flight or flight, fight or flight response. It's yeah. like you you handled it. And that's as you know, that's a second to be like, I'm proud of myself for the way I handled that. And look at like that just showed you like it pays off to really, you know stick up for yourself and honor does, yourself. Yeah. 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 And all those little ways that you, that like, I, I say this to some of my clients, um, like pretty much every, every day, when's the last time you told yourself you were proud of yourself? And the mm-hmm. answer is like, never. So I want you to stop right now. Everybody listening, stop right now, put your arms around yourself. Come on, you two and say your name, whatever your name is for near as I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of myself. I'm proud Say it of again. Myself. Say your name. Brittany, Brittany Rizzo. Rizzo. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. And that little nitpicky voice might go, for what? I haven't done anything good lately. Oh, yes, you have. Just as you are in this very moment, you are good enough to be proud of yourself for nothing in particular. Yeah. Just waking up today. Can I get an amen? Amen. (laughs) Literally just waking up today and doing something like, honestly, you got to be proud for all the little things. Being human is hard. That's right. (laughs) And that's why we have to support each other Mm -hmm. and and help each other through Mm -hmm. with all these little tiny things, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Now, how much time do you have left? Do you have a ton? Okay. (laughs) I have, I have like two more questions I want to ask you. Great. Please. Before you yeah. Go. I, I don't have anything else. And I, okay. I know well, we one, could talk I, for days. I know. I wanted to bring up, I wrote this quote down about how we, ne- you say we neglect our, our elders. Our lives are very much yeah. designed around obsessively outrunning the reality that we will not always be young and beautiful. And I mean, I, I don't even have a question for that. I just like, it hit me so hard that like, we just really like people disregard women especially the second you're not young and beautiful and then we fight to not be invisible in this world as much as possible and so right. reading that and like really honoring our elders and respecting them and remembering that they are still human and this is also their first time on earth still just because they've been here longer like they've never been 75 before they've never been yeah. 76 before they've never had to go to a retirement home before they've never just broken a bone by stepping the wrong way like things ha- are happening as you get older and it's just so important to have empathy and compassion towards your elders and especially like you know the people in your life who are getting older like make the phone call call your grandma call your papa your grandfather whatever you call them like call them and have the compassion and empathy for them like i just i really loved that you put that in the book good i'm glad that resonated and yeah I agree with everything you're saying. I heard a quote recently that was like, I don't know what the quote was, but it was basically saying, um, you know, you look at somebody old, you look at an old person, right? Mm -hmm. And you have all these judgmental thoughts about them. But just remember that old age is not them. It's happening to them. Mm -hmm. Like you just said, they are experiencing this for the first time. And I just have so much respect and compassion for anybody who is embracing getting older. Mm -hmm. And I love what you're saying about it's not us versus them. It's all of us. This is Mm -hmm. all of us. We're all getting older. And the the toxicity of all this anti-aging shit (sighs) is crap. Anti-aging is a marketing ploy Mm -hmm. that's not true. You can't anti-age. And it's not just about having compassion for the elderly. 
but it's about having compassion for ourselves mm -hmm. because guess what? We're getting older every day. Mm -hmm. And I am now, like I said, entering my forties and it's not easy, man. I'm terrified of getting older. And there are many ego deaths that go along with that. There is a lot of grace and acceptance and self-love that has to start to strengthen within you to have the courage to face getting older. Mm -hmm. And, ah, uh, God, it's not easy. You know, you look at your face in the mirror and you go, holy shit, I look totally different than I did 10 years ago. What the hell are these wrinkles? Ah, my life yeah. is over. Nobody's going to love me. I can't have a career now. My husband's going to leave me. I'm shit. I should just give up and lay down and just call it a day. Yeah. No, 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 no. Right. We don't do that. We do not do that. It's crazy. <laughs> the best is yet to come. Yeah. And we'll deal with it when we get there. Mm -hmm. And you I know? felt like I am finally in this moment in time, I can honestly say when I look in the mirror, this is the happiest I felt looking at myself because I feel like I see myself and yeah. I worked hard to become this person. That's right. I took out the hair extensions and the lash extensions and all the stuff I'm high. I was hiding underneath. For That's so right. Long. Yes. And I see myself and I see who I am. But in the flip side of that, I go, oh, my God, is this going to go away? Like, oh, my God, this isn't going to last forever and I need to enjoy it now. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on. Like you didn't yeah. think you'd be here when you were 21. You thought that was exactly the best ever look. So now exactly I'm 32. And I'm like, no, this is like the best I felt in my skin. And it, it shows it shows differently because I'm happy. Like I was exactly. 21 and they, youth is wasted on the young. I was 21 and I was whatever, but I didn't think I was because of all the other things happening outside of me that were just like, I'm comparing myself to literally everybody else. Yeah, so, exactly. You never it, even could have imagined the age you're at now. No. And, and now it's like hitting me like, okay, so, you know, my looks and, and the way I presented myself, because uh, our personalities are interesting and they change as we get older. Mm -hmm. uh, who and, and they are, they're not like one solid thing. The personality that you and I and everyone listening is presenting to the world is a construct mm -hmm. of all these things that we wish to be seen as. They mm -hmm. don't have anything to do with who we truly are on the inside. So- and we're, we're constantly changing. So I think like, okay, so like the personality construct that I played around with in my first 40 years of life, uh, now what? Like what's gonna get me through the next 40 years as my body starts to change more and more, as my looks start to change, all the things my ego defined Lucy Walsh as mm -hmm. are changing. They are going to leave me. So what is going to nourish me and help me enjoy the next 40 years and make it mm. the best years of my life. You know, I don't believe in glory days. I don't live that way. I don't speak that way. I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I think every given moment of our life is the best moment of our life. And the best is always yet to come. I don't care if that's, you know, if you're 80, 90. And the thing that keeps us young is that curiosity about life, about ourselves, and about each other. You look at some people that are your age and you think, Jesus Christ, you're old. <laughs> yeah, because they're dead inside, because they're shut yeah, down. Yeah. They're not curious about anything. They're not continuing to learn and grow. Uh -huh. That's what makes you old. Mm -hmm. So stay young forever. You wanna know what the real anti-aging is? It's what I just said. Mm -hmm. So they don't sell it in a fucking bottle. You know what I mean? <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> Like you're truly like, I mean, the thing is, is like, I, be I believe every single word you're saying, like, because it's so <laughs> deeply, it's so true. And like, it's so true. It's like, well, what else do you want? Like, what else do you want? This is a real deal. Like, what else do you want out of this? Exactly. I, like, I, I just absolutely adore that. And one of my last questions, well, second to last, sorry, you can tell me when you have to go, but I guess I could probably talk Please. to you forever. Well, we're going to be friends after this. So Yay. we'll have a lot more, <laughs> many more conversations. Yes. Do you drink wine? I don't, but I love a good mocktail. Do you not drink any alcohol? I don't. Girl? I know. It's been like Are almost- Are you sober? I'm not like in a program sober, but I just was like, you know, nothing really great happens to me when I drink and I'm already kind of a nut. So- well, I have that, I have that thought every day, but I continue to drink. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny. I, my friend Raven, who was on the podcast too, she really got me hooked on mocktails and she mm. has like not drank as much because she's like, these mocktails are just as great. And we like have little craft nights and moon rituals right. and this and that. Like we still do everything we can do, but it's just like, it's the act of the drink that exactly. people like. Yeah, it is. Yeah. With no so hangover. The hand to mouth. Yeah. And some mouth action. Yeah. Okay. Well then we'll have many conversations over a mocktail. Yes. I love that. <laughs> yeah. There's some really great like fake rosés out there, which is like, oh, and it's love like it. a placebo effect a little bit. It absolutely <laughs> is. Yeah. But so in your book, you say Google search can tell us what people have achieved, but it can't tell us who they are. So what is something you wish people knew about you that they cannot Google? Oh, well, nobody knows this but since i was five years old i have had an ambulance prayer that i say every single time i hear an ambulance drive by and i made it up when i was five and i have probably said it a hundred thousand times in my life would you like to hear it yes let's hear it this is an exclusive now i've never said it okay it goes like this <laughs> whatever i'm doing it could be an interview it could be a meeting I close my eyes and I say, please hold, I have to say my ambulance prayer. And I say, dear God, please let whoever is in that accident or near it be safe. And if they die, please let them go to a very good place. Amen. I love that. Yes. It's like a tick I have. Like, I'll do it. I'll even do it if I hear an ambulance in a movie. Oh, my gosh. Well, a tick I have is I will mimic the sound of the ambulance or a car horn. Oh, wow. Like, if I hear a car horn. So you and I probably should not hang out together too much because you'll be... I'll be praying every time you have I'll your tick. Like, and you'll be praying. I'll be like, dear God, please let me stop. You're like, all right. Fuck, it was you again. <laughs> oh my God. Just in an endless circle of praying and, and mimicking a horn. Just nonstop. Oh my God. See, we don't need alcohol. <laughs> no, who needs alcohol? <laughs> that is amazing. Well, I thought you oh. were going to talk about when, since you were five, you had your blankie. Like your oh, blankie huh. song. Oh, the blankie song. Yes. Yeah. Of course the I did. Yeah. Song. Don't wash my blankie. Don't take it away. I want to drag it around while I play. I didn't have a blankie, but I had this song about a blankie that I would listen to every day. And Why that's what I have a blankie to go with the song. And that's what comforted you? Yeah. That was what comforted me was the blankie song, not a blankie. That's so funny. Isn't that I, weird? I mean, I have an Elmo doll and I don't know if you've seen Aww. all the Elmo memes in the past 24 hours. Like no, Elmo, I have not. So Elmo asked the world like, hey, just doing a check-in, how are you doing? And everybody's like, I'm about to lose my shit, Elmo. I'm like this close to jumping. Like it would became yeah. like this insane thread of over like 250 million responses. Holy shit. And then it was like actually a meme of Jack Nicholson swishing around a drink going me about to trauma dump on Elmo. <laughs> and it, it like became this big viral thing, but I have an Elmo doll that I've had since I was two. And so oh. people were like, oh, this is what you're, that's why your Elmo looks the way it does. Cause that's hilarious. That thing has been through it, but. Oh, so what was your trauma? Did you join in the trauma dump on Elmo or are you going to do it privately? He gets one every night. <laughs> I was going to say he's probably had enough on a daily yeah. basis. Yeah, he's he's literally that poor guy has seen some seen some shit. That's wow. for sure. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. Well, I absolutely adore you. I feel like I mean, I ask everybody this question. I feel like, gosh, we can literally I mean, I know there's just it's so much dangerous. I feel I like I, I didn't even scratch the surface, even though we've been talking for over an hour. But I'm like, but 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 but, but, but what about this? What favorite movie? What's your favorite movie? Oh, man. What's a movie that's timeless to you that you can never not watch if it's on TV? Because mine's Titanic. Uh, okay. So mine is Braveheart. What? Why yes. Why like very, like, like those are weird movies to want to watch over and over again. They're not very lighthearted. <laughs> no, they're not lighthearted at all. I like the real kill yourself stuff. Um, <laughs> can I even say that? I don't even know if that's allowed. But um, can I tell you a very short story about how Braveheart has impacted my life? Tell me anything. Okay. So when it came out, I was like 12 or whatever. A lot of shit happened when I was 12. I keep mentioning the age 12. Honestly, 12, th that 12 to 15 was like, woof. I know. Or I Maybe think every like, girl. Yeah. Every, um, that was a crazy time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 
when it came out, I was instantly obsessed. Don't know why. I've always felt a past life connection to Scotland. No reason. And uh, I learned like every note of the entire score. I'm really obsessed with film scores. Like I know them mm. by heart. I can like, like you're a friend's connoisseur. I can like call any film score out and whatever. Oh, that's um, amazing. And so I learned the whole thing entirely on the piano. And then when I met my, my now husband, he'd never seen it and he's from England and we were in England and I made him watch it. And it was like one of the scenes, the love scenes. And I said, Oh God, a man on his knees in a Scottish forest is my ultimate fantasy. So he surprised me and took me to Scotland. He took me up behind a castle, behind Inverary Castle, and he got down on his knees and he proposed to me. Oh my God. It was the sweetest thing. He made my brave heart fantasy come true. And that was why we got engaged in Scotland. And it was perfect. That is so sweet. Now I got to find a guy to get on a ship for me and <laughs> move over on the door. <laughs> You gotta find your jack i don't know just take me out on a boat and say you jump i jump and then i'll be happy yeah that's <laughs> that's fine oh my gosh that is so like that uh, movie i mean i i remember seeing that movie yeah and it was like before netflix that i had like streaming on the tv and i watched it on my phone oh my god All of it's Braveheart. so not meant for that i know but it also gave me severe nightmares <laughs> Yeah, it's devastating. <laughs> Terrifying. Terrifying. It really is. First, I have to say this too. You have a music note on your wrist and so do I. Oh my goodness. I yours keep noticing it. And very then, much out does on, mine. I yeah. Mean, you can't see it, but on my ankle, it says Lucy. I was going to say, is that my name? Did you do that just for this? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because, uh, well, my first dog's name was Lucy and Lucy's like oh. one of my favorite names ever. And she was like my everything. I had her from three to 17. And then this is her name in my mom's handwriting. Oh, that's so special. And then right when I found out I was going to do your interview, I literally got this. Um, my All my friends and I, we got 1111 tattoos because we always text nice. each other at 1111. And yeah. then the name of the font was Timeless. Like everything. Oh my God. It's all very, the synchronicities are all there. They are. <laughs> it really is a magical world. It yeah, is. these are the treble and bass clef mm -hmm. on my right and left hand, so I don't forget which hand to play with. <laughs> well, I have Just I joking. have one step at a time on my foot, so I don't forget how to walk. So apparently, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we need directions sometimes. <laughs> my whole body's just going to be a post-it note of people's names and <laughs> like way. turn right, turn. <laughs> my don't address. Touch that. Literally, my address is going to please return. Like. <laughs> Oh we need gosh. help. We I need know, help, guys. Know. Humans need help. We have each other now. We do, yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> last question, I promise you. Okay. Before you go, I ask everybody, what is the best piece of advice you've gotten or you would give to somebody, whether it be their personal life or for the industry, or what's something that really has stuck with you that you carry with you all the time? So a piece of advice that... I would like to pass on and that I really focus on every day. Um, I think kind of came from me. I think I kind of made it up, but you know, we've all heard it is that you are enough in mm -hmm. this very moment, just as you are, you are lovable. You are worthy. You don't need to fix anything about yourself. You don't need to change a single thing to be loved and the right people will always stay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so true. You don't ever need to convince anyone to love you. Mm -mm. I love that. It's so true. Like, I mean, especially in this day and age of social media and outside yeah. validation and yeah. needing the approval, whether it be for a job or a relationship or this or that, like you are enough just as you are. Yeah. Like, you, if you you shouldn't spend your energy convincing other people in your life or new people or whoever to love you but like really focus on the people who do and give them your time and energy 
Yeah. And those and relationships become way more special and beautiful. Exactly. And and before any of that can happen, it's really you and you. Mm -hmm. And loving yourself, mm -hmm. you know, is the most fulfilling love affair you could ever have. Yeah. And and I try to have a love affair with myself every day now. Mm. That's such and a good I way can, to put it. Yeah. Then I can show up for the relationships in my life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with joy and, and appreciation. Mm -hmm. So take those bubble baths and light those candles and put that perfume on even when you're in your home alone because it's you, baby. Yeah. You're worth it. <laughs> that should be a CoverGirl commercial. It should. It should. It has a nice ring to it. So you have singer, author, actress, pianist, dancer. What is next? What do you, what is the one thing you're like, I haven't done this yet? Is it directing? Have you directed? You've already directed. No, it's not directing. I don't want to direct, but it is my feature film that I have written about the letters. And I wrote it as a vehicle for myself as an actress. Mm -hmm. And, um, all of my focus will be on that next. Mm -hmm. And we are planning to somehow crazily move towards pre-production this year or in 2025. But uh, it's all systems go. And I'm, I'm very, Amazing. very driven to get that done next. So, so are you going to play Wanda? I think so. I feel like you I, have to. I was told by her again through a medium <laughs> that I needed to play her, um, which I don't believe because I'm a little older than the character in the film now, but with everything that's happening with AI, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It's all possible. So remove a few of these, you know, lines in the old forehead and get me in front of that camera. Yeah, but, well, right now, the only person I'm playing is Uncle Fester with these dark <laughs> circles. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to be kind to myself. Never mind. It's not true. Yeah. <laughs> ah! I love you. Oh, my gosh. Um, uh, yeah. So, you know, maybe there's like a nice little role in there for you if you're interested. Look, I would. Yes. It's such a beautiful. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's a bump in. It's a beautiful story. And I just I, I can't tell people enough to like read this book. And it's like time travel, time capsule, timeless, anything. It's just, and again, it just made me think so much about how special every moment with my grandparents, like it's, yeah. it just becomes so much more meaningful when you realize it's never going to, those moments are never going to happen again. And I you know. hold on to those memories and you get little glimmers of their lives and realize that they were a full person before you came oh around. God. Yeah. You know? And so, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, we think of our elders as just like my grandma or my mom or whatever. And mm -hmm. like, God, they had, ugh, they were right where we are now. Can mm -hmm. I finish by sharing just one thing that I um, am affiliated with? Yes. So, along the lines of what my book deals with, because I spent the time in the nursing home with my grandmother, and that's where the book takes place a lot of it. I have partnered with an organization called the National Association of Long-Term Care Volunteers. Mm -hmm. I know it's a mouthful, but what they do is they, on a national level, they help bring volunteer companions into nursing homes. It's a very simple training program, and you could today go to your local nursing home because every community has many, many nursing homes. You could walk in there right now and ask to sit with someone and play cards or read a book or just talk to them or play music or whatever. They are uh, always in need of companions for many, many elderly people who are literally sitting in a corner staring at the wall because they have no visitors. Yeah. And it's a very ignored part of society like we've been talking about. And I really feel very strongly about advocating for it, especially with the substance of my book. And um, I've done a lot of that work myself. I can promise you it's not as scary as you think. It's extraordinarily life-changing for, for the companion as well. And it's so easy to, to get involved. So please reach out to me if you're interested. You can follow me and DM me. I'm the Lucy Walsh on all the socials. 
And uh, there will be a lot more on that as as the book moves forward, but I want to put it out there. I love that so much. That's amazing. And I really, yeah. I do hope people take up that opportunity. Yeah, because not everybody has elderly family loved ones in their life, you know, and you still want to give give back somehow and make a difference. And, and this is a great way to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when does this book come out? This book publishes on March 12th. It's available for pre-sale on Amazon right now. It's a great gift to give loved ones. So please buy multiple copies and give them as gifts. I, uh, I'm so just so excited for everybody to read and share, share their own experiences. And I will be starting a podcast in the near future where I ask, uh, guests on, just like all yourselves listening to uh, share their own family letters and artifacts, because mm. this is another thing we all share is we all have these special letters within our families during times of war, times of peace. And I'm creating this special show to, to hear many stories. So that'll be coming as well. Mm, I love that. Lucy, thank you so much for thank your you. time. This was incredible i literally i haven't felt this present and this like just so connected with somebody in a very long time oh and gosh. so i really appreciate it and i'm truly truly just so excited to see how this book rewards you because it's i just know it's going to be a very rewarding experience for you getting this yeah. out there because it's going to affect a lot of people the way it affected me like there's no doubt and it's going to feel like you know, I feel like it's going to bring you closer to Wanda too, even more Absolutely. so. Absolutely. Yeah. It's done all that. And I, I'm, I'm, it's so, so surreal that it's now out in the world. I, I just, I'm so grateful and emotional about it. So thank you so much, Brittany, this, I feel the same. I feel just connected and really, you know, aligned with you. And that's such yeah. a wonderful feeling. And I know we will stay connected and I can't wait to give you a hug in person. I know, I know. <laughs> Mocktails and hugs. Here we go. So okay. thank you for having me. I adore you. Mwah. Goodbye. Mwah. Bye. Bye.